Hey guys, welcome back to episode number two of Cloud Security Engineering. And before we get into what the meat of our uh, episode is going to be, uh, I just want to give uh, a little aside here about what's going on in the global um, scene with the pandemic that's happening with COVID-19. And just to kind of reiterate something that I've been seeing a lot in my community here in Denver, uh, but also kind of in a few different places. My family's in New York and they've been telling me the same kind of thing. And it seems like it's not really been taken seriously by people of our age. I'm 26, people younger than me as well. Uh, people are still going out, people are still kind of going about their normal lives. And I'm not telling them to not do that. I'm just saying that I think there's a lot of risk in going out, catching the virus. Um, if you're our age, admittedly, you're probably going to be okay, but you could pass it on to someone that's older. Um, so just, just try to be more mindful of that. I hope you guys all stay safe. Hope you guys all stay healthy. Um, if you're looking for a community in this kind of time, if you have a lot of downtime, which a lot of us do, I've been working from home, definitely join the Discord. I'll leave the uh, Discord link in the description below. We have a great community of people that are all like-minded. We're all focused on learning. We're all focused on community, especially in a time like this. Um, yeah, just want to give a little aside on that. But let's get into today's episode. It's going to be about IM users and... Uh, I am policies. So just to give a, a background of what policies are, uh, it's basically going to be the amount of permissions and the permissioning that you're going to give your users when they're in your AWS infrastructure. So for example, a good amount of admin users to have on a specific AWS account is baseline five, right? Could go up, could go down, but usually it's about five. Now, if you have a developer in your infrastructure, you're not going to want to give them admin privileges. They don't need that. Uh, they might need privileges to access specific development EC2 hosts that they're going to push code to. They might need access to a code repository via code commit. And you're going to have to provision them with the correct permissions to go about their daily job. But as we're a security focused YouTube channel and we're trying to be security minded individuals, you don't want to just hand out permissioning, um, kind of out on a, on a whim. You want to really focus on everything you can in permissioning. And when I say focus, I mean in AWS, you can get very, very granular with the, the kinds of permissioning that you can give. Um, for example, you have EC2 hosts that we talked about in the last episode. You can give permission to uh, write on an EC2 host, but then you can revoke permission on an S3 bucket, which is a centralized storage location. Um, so you can really parse your resources and permission based on that parsing. So I hope today that we can kind of add context to a lot of the questions that I've been getting asked after that video. Um, a lot, I think a lot of people tried to do what I said to do at the end of the video, but didn't focus on giving themselves the correct permissions to go about and do those things. Uh, so today I'm going to be showing you that. Uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, the feedback was immense from the last video. Uh, I think it's at like 500 views now, which is insane for the channel that we have. We got about 40 new subscribers. So that's amazing. I can't thank you guys enough. I uh, hope you guys like this one the same way. I uh, hope you guys learn a lot. If you do, tell me what you learned down in the comments below. If you didn't learn something, you want to see it next time, tell me down in the comments below um, or give me some feedback in the Discord. But uh, let's hop right into it, guys. All right, so when you're going to be looking to uh, do IAM user provisioning, um, I, I just want to say it off the bat that this is mainly a function of DevOps when you're in a built-up tech company. Um, usually security will have uh, a huge say in the kind of permissions that they give to DevOps, but in terms of actually provisioning or providing the permissions and creating the users, this is going to go to DevOps. Uh, but it's definitely something that you need to know in order to be uh, able to speak back and forth with DevOps. And, th and that's going to be uh, another video in and of itself. But the relationship between um, DevOps and SecOps or DevOps and Sec Engineering is one that has to be very cohesive. In order for it to be cohesive, I think both parties need to understand the skills and the deficits of both. Um, DevOps tends to be very technical. So if you're in a non-technical security role, such as SecOps, 
you may not be able to hang with them when it comes to technical talk, uh, when it talks, when it comes to code pipeline talk, when it comes to uh, permissioning talk, um, in terms of pushing permissions using TypeScript or JSON or any of that stuff. So uh, two recommendations is I would recommend that you definitely get integrated with code in some way, but I would also recommend that you be wary and that you be uh, respectful in any interaction that you have cross team, uh, especially the DevOps, SecOps, cross team collaboration, because that can be seen as DevOps needs to get all these deadlines done very quickly. They need to push user provisioning out very quickly. And SecOps and security in general is a naturally restrictive workflow where they're going to constantly, um, for no fault on either side, but they're going to constantly want to be doing different things. DevOps is going to be want to push, be pushing things quickly. Security is going to be wanting to restrict access and in turn, and by the nature of security, slow down the production of certain things, but for a good reason. So in order to understand I am provisioning and I am permissioning, you're going to need to understand a few different things about how permissions work at a basic level. Now this could be at a Linux instance level or this could be at a level that we'll see here in the console when we go to IM. But you're gonna have users, groups, and roles. Users are individual users, right? So it could be you, it could be me. Now a lot of companies don't run off of individual users going to different accounts. Um, but in this case, we're gonna do that. And then you have groups. So a group could be a group of developers. You're gonna to wanna to give them all similar permissions. And AWS makes it very easy to do that because you can provide uh, blanket level permissioning for an entire group of users if you set it under groups. But for today, we're just gonna be doing users. So if you wanna create a user, you'd come in here, you'd click create user, add user. Uh, for the purpose of this, we'll do test one. And when you come down here and you see programmatic access, this is gonna be console access. And when I say console access, I mean down here in the terminal, right? So if you're gonna be logging in with a CLI, and that's gonna be in, I think, video three or four. But if you're gonna be logging in with a CLI, you're gonna be wanting to provision your users with programmatic access. So they have an access key ID and a secret key ID for the APIs, the CLIs, the software development kits, and the CDKs. Um, but that's in another video. So for this, we're just gonna provision them with AWS Management Console Access, and they're gonna auto-generate a password, right? So this might be pretty obvious to some, but I think it's definitely worth saying. It's just gonna generate a password that you're gonna to send to the person, and they're gonna log in, and then as soon as they log in, per this rule here, they're gonna be able to reset their password to what they wanna be. Obviously, you don't wanna share passwords, that's pretty basic. Um, so if you wanted to create a group here, right? If you wanted to just throw them an admin um, for this proof of concept, we only have an administrator, which would be myself, but you don't want to throw them in just an admin, right? So you're going to create a group and you're going to come here and you're going to see a whole list of policies. Now these policies pertain to almost anything you could think of, right? So we have a policy for Amazon EC2 can say container service auto scale role. And this basically means that you can put auto scaling groups on uh, EC2s, um, you could look at CloudWatch events. Um, and these are all things that, that may come with time when you learn um, in terms of EC2 or in terms of CloudWatch events. But again, I, I hope that over this series that a lot of that stuff becomes apparent to you. But for the proof of this, or for the sake of this, we're just gonna go in here, we're gonna create our own test group, test one, and we're gonna create a policy for that group. Now, like I said in the beginning, when you're creating a policy, you're basically provisioning the permissions for that specific user or for that specific group. And then you can add other users to that group as you go along. Now, like I said before, AWS does a really good job in segmenting their services. So there's a list of things we can do here. We can do um, Elastic Kubernetes service. We can do um, anything you think of, Elastic Load Balancing. All of these separate resources, and trust me, I know there's a lot, don't get overwhelmed by the sheer volume of these resources. I'm in this every single day and I've probably used 30 of them. So don't, don't get overwhelmed. But the, the main one we're gonna wanna focus on is EC2, right? Because when you're in a development life cycle, you're gonna be giving developers permissions to a specific EC2 that holds a specific code in it. So you can kind of partition 
say you give uh, one developer access to one application of code, you give another developer access to another application of code, if one of those developers is only working on that application, they shouldn't have access to all of your applications within your infrastructure. That's bad security. Um, so the, AWS does a really, really good job of segmenting all your resources, all your networks, all your users. And it's really just the job of us, this being the security team or the DevOps team to come in and then do the work necessary to provision the correct users with the correct access. So here we could see that we have I think five different kinds of access uh, uh, levels. <clears throat> so we have list, read, tagging, and write. Tagging is gonna be a little more high level than what we're doing here. Tagging basically specifies that you can tag specific resources with the same tag, thus giving the similar, giving similar permissions to that tag, right? So for the sake of this, if we wanted to go into this EC2 and develop anything in it, we would definitely need read, we would definitely need write, Right, and you can also go and do the drop down bar here, and it's going to have a ton of different things that you can partition. Right, so if I wanted to be able to uh, keep someone from locating an address, right, but I wanted them to have all of the permissions, all I would do is check this box off here. Right, there's there's that much of a granular approach to permissioning in AWS. AWS. So we have read, we have write, and we're definitely gonna want list as well. We're gonna wanna be able to list things inside the EC2 as a developer. We're gonna wanna be able to read things inside the EC2 as a developer, and we're gonna wanna want to be able to write things inside the EC2 as a developer. And that's basically it for the uh, beginning permissioning. You can also specify request permissions, right? So with these request, condi request conditions, um, you can have MFA required, which is definitely something you wanna do. And you could have source IP required. And source IP essentially says that all of these permissions will only turn on if it comes from that specified source IP that you specified at the permissioning or the provisioning level for that specific developer. So say I'm a developer, I'm getting provisioned um, AWS access, and I have a source IP of 192.168.0.1. I understand that's a gateway, but for this proof of concept, just bear with me here. The only way I'm gonna be able to access my permissions to that EC2 is if I'm from that source IP. Now, the good thing about this is if you have a client-side VPN, if your developers are working remote, or if you just wanna have them VPN in client-side to increase your security posture, you can create a range here that the VPN is going to always abide by. And that means that the only way that someone could have access to these permissions is if they sign into that VPN and they log in with that source IP. Just another layered security model that I think AWS does really, really well. Um, so after we would do that, and again, you can go through and you can, I'm not gonna do this for this video. I think it's, I think it's pretty obvious what you can do, but based on your specific needs, you can go through here and take away describe volumes, right? So they're not able to describe storage volumes, you can go in here and take away describe VPC attributes so they can't see the attributes of the VPC they're running on. You can really segment your permissioning and I think it's a, it's a great resource that Amazon has. Now, this literally just means any and it's always gonna be separated by a colon here. So you're always gonna have the Amazon resource number, it's going to have AWS and then it's gonna have your resource name here. So it's gonna be S3 EC2, excuse me, RDES. Um, this always going to be followed by the region. So in this case, it's any. This could be followed by the account number. And this could be followed by the other resource that it's talking to. And then that's going to be followed by the ID of that resource, right? You don't really have to remember the syntax of that, but just be able to read these definitely so you don't look at one of these and freak out. Uh, it, it really just is an identifier for the resource that you're trying to talk to. So when we come to the policy summary, we're always going to be able to see the GUI version, as I like to call it, the user interface inter uh, version um, so in the user interface version it's going to see or it's going to show services the access level to those services the resources that those services can point to and then the request condition so this means these things need to be met in order for you to access these services so in this case you need to have mfa multi-factor authentication enabled in order to request access to the ec2 service and in turn, be able to read all resources within that EC2, right? So like we talked about before, all those policies or all those permissions that we listed.
There's also another way that you can view these kind of policies. This may look a little foreign to you guys, especially if you haven't done any code or um, any development at all. But this is going to be the way that you want to be able to read your policy. Because in terms of scripting these things out, you're going to script it out in a JSON format like this. And you're most likely going to call it through a pipeline to then provision it to multiple users. So what I mean by that is you don't want to go in and provision every single user individually. That's going to take an exacerbation exacerbate exorbitant amount of time jesus and that's really not something you want to do as a security team, right it's basically what this is saying is this is the policy version that we have the uh service id is visual editor you don't have to worry about that it's going to show your service id the effect that we're doing in the actual policy is allowing something and the action we're allowing is an EC2 get console screenshot. Now, this is very basic. This wouldn't be what yours would be like. You'd have a, a, a plethora of actions that you would see under that. You could see get resources. You could see describe resources. But for this proof of concept in this video, we're just going to show the actual syntax of it. Now, the resource that we're doing this uh, action on is going to be that ARN that I was talking about uh, previously. And then the multi-factor authentication has to be present in order to allow that. And it's going to then come down to another ID down here. And it's going to have another effect, which is allow. And this time the action is EC2 describe tags. This means that if you're in that EC2, you can describe tags. You can describe the VPN connections within that EC2. And the list goes on. You can get password data. You can get the console output. And all these can be supplemented in or taken, uh, or taken out based on your infrastructure and based on the requirements that you have within your security program right so this is how granular we can get and one thing i want to call out here is when you see resource star that means resources all right so you can access all of these things on all resources after you get inside ec2 um and that's always something to keep in mind because that can be a huge deal like a, a when you see that as a, a person in security and you see that you can, oh my God, you can allow everything into this resource. That may look really, really terrible, but a lot of the times Amazon puts out services that seem really, really cool. And I'm not trying to badmouth them at all. It's an it's a amazing service, but they put out services that seem really cool, but they don't really think about the backend processes that you have to go through to connect to that service. So in terms of, say, Security Hub, which is another Amazon service, they always throw these things out and they don't actually think of, hey, this might go wrong, that might go wrong. They kind of learn on the fly. And I know that might seem kind of foreign because Amazon is a huge company, but that still happens at a high level. Um, so in terms of putting resource star, this might be a permission that you might need to put in order to access a pipeline or access a cross-account rule or access anything. There's... A lot of things that get solved by putting a star in either the resource or the permissioning and then backdooring those permissionings or those permissions and covering them by other permissions, right? So you have layered security. One permission set might be very um, open. Another permission set that goes on top of it might be very closed. And they do different kind of things. In terms of when you come into a company and you're creating IAM users, I just kind of want to wrap this up, but when you're creating IAM users, this is one way that you can do it, right? You can come in through the console. You can, I'm trying really hard not to show my access key right now. You can come in through the console or the GUI as we call it, and you can click. You can do a ton of things like that, right? You can come in, you can provision one user by another. You can go to another user. You can go assign a role. You can assign a policy. Um, you can do it step by step like that. But a lot of companies are going to ask and require you to do things programmatically. And that's going to come in with the CLI and bash scripting. And that's what we're going to cover in the next video. I hope you guys can be there. Uh, I hope you guys learned a lot in this video. All right, guys. Episode two wrapped up. I hope you guys learned a lot. Um, I know I am permissioning isn't the most exciting thing, but I really think it's a good baseline to have if you're going to be in a security environment or you're going to try to stand up your own security program. I really appreciate you guys watching these videos. Like I said, the uh, support has been insane on them. Um, and one thing I just wanna kind of leave you guys with is for the love of God, just wash your hands this week, okay? Everyone have a good night. I'll see you guys later.